Hello, fifth grade. We're going to start reading some more of Dust by Arthur Slade. We're going to try to read chapters 10 and 11 today if my voice holds out. So here goes, chapter 10. <clears throat> a mass of murmuring bodies shuffled into the bright light of a burning sun. They shaded their eyes and squinted at each other. Robert felt they were walking out of some imaginary place into the real world. Or perhaps it was the opposite, and they had just stumbled onto a strange planet devastated by a war with the sun. It burned their skin, the fields, everything under its gaze. Maybe the real world, cool and inviting, was back inside the theater. No one wanted to leave the front steps. They leaned against the railing, plugged up the passage. Some even turned around as if to go back inside. Robert was jostled by elbows and purses. The stink of underarm sweat wafted in the air. He wished he were taller, then maybe he wouldn't smell it. Uncle Alden squeezed in beside Robert and his parents. What a snail oil trick, he hissed quietly. All smoke and mirrors. Robert's dad remained silent, pulling Robert by the hand, guiding him through the crowd. Then his grip loosened and Robert looked up. His parents were gone, swallowed by the mass of people. Robert stepped over feet, around legs, and got too close to the war widows. One reached out to pull him to her bosom or do something equally frightening, so he ducked and launched himself into the forest of arms and legs. He figured he'd be able to spot his parents from the other side of the street. Escape was only inches away. He watched his step, avoided several more elbows, and finally bumped into a heavy-set man in a suit. It's all for nothing, he heard the man announce hoarsely. All of it. Robert knew the voice. He looked up to see Reverend Gibbs, hunched over, holding his side. People avoided him as though he were a big stone in the middle of a field. It's futile, he said. What? Robert asked. What did you say? The Reverend raised his head, revealing wild, red-rimmed eyes. Robert had once seen a stray dog crazy with rabies, and its eyes had looked like that. Gibbs blinked, and his pupils remained dilated. Who's there, he said. It's Robert Steelgate, sir. The Reverend blinked again, recognition lighting up his face. Hello, Robert. It's good to see you. Why is it all for nothing? Robert asked. Did you see something in the mirror? The reverend's upper lip trembled. You be a good boy, he whispered. Stay close to your parents now. Remember your brother. Keep close and God will watch you. He will. Reverend Gibbs stumbled past Robert and limped down the boardwalk, his feet thumping on the wood. Sometimes faith breaks, a gentle voice said. It's always a pity. Robert started and whipped around to find Abraham standing there, watching the reverend head up the hill toward the rectory. You've caught my interest, the man told him. What? Robert looked for his parents. Everyone seemed frozen and silent, as if they had been turned to pillars of salt. You represent something. I don't know exactly what. Abraham leaned closer. He smelled of lemons. I do have a very important scientific question to ask you. It would help immensely if you answered truthfully. You do want to help, don't you? Robert was confused. What could Abraham possibly want to hear? He nodded solemnly. Good. Abraham's eyes became the only thing Robert could see. Flecks of gold swirled through the man's pupils. Tell me what you saw in the mirror today. Robert's limbs froze. Only his lips moved. Nothing, he said. Just darkness. Abraham narrowed his eyes. A line creased his forehead. Nothing? But I know everyone sees something. It's only human. That mirror is the ultimate development in the science of mesmerism. To look at its reflections, to look at your own desires, your needs. But some can see farther, into other places. Are you sure you didn't even see a shadow, perhaps? A man on a battlefield? Hear a message from beyond? Robert closed his eyes. His heart was racing, his throat dry. It would be bad if Abraham knew what had happened in the mirror. It would make Robert feel like a traitor somehow. I can't tell him, Robert thought. I can't. I can't. He swallowed. Rain, he answered, spitting out the word as though he were dislodging a stone from his throat. I saw rain in my father's fields, falling really soft. Abraham stared for an eternity. Robert met his eyes, trying to look as honest as possible. Finally, Abraham nodded. His gloved hand rested on Robert's shoulder with the weight of a crow. You're a very curious young man, aren't you? And I say man, 
because you're not really a boy anymore. You're getting too tall, growing too old. Robert didn't think he was old or tall. I feel sorry for you. One morning you will get up and your dreams will stay in your pillow. His hand tightened. What if I told you that some individuals are born without a soul and have to wander for thousands and thousands of years searching for a way to fill that void? They become pharaohs, forcing slaves to build pyramids or rise from peasant to emperor and command vast conquering armies or compel tribes in the jungle to worship them. And still they feel empty. What if I told you that? Would you believe me? Robert looked into Abraham's pale face, his all-knowing eyes. It had to be true. Those eyes had seen battles and wars and stars dying in the heavens. Robert believed. He felt it in the center of his heart, but he sensed he should never admit it. Better to hide that knowledge, the same way he had hidden his John Carter books. No, Robert said, trying to sound confident. What you're saying isn't true. People don't live that long. Abraham smiled and released his grip. You're right, he said. You're right. The crowd came to life, moving and talking again. A farmer looked startled to see Abraham standing right in front of him. Abraham smiled, extended his arm, and shook hands, calling the man by name. Robert watched Abraham work his way through the people, shaking more hands, patting shoulders, and jesting. He even kissed one lady's pro-offered hands, fingers. Okay, chapter 11. The sun had baked the wheat golden brown, turning the stalks hollow and hard. The heads swayed in the wind, moving in waves. Even though Robert lived thousands of miles from the nearest ocean, he was sure the field looked like one. The patches of brown dirt could be islands. The harvest would be soon. His dad had told him as much. In fact, his father had been telling him a lot these days, talking nonstop as they worked on the tractor. So I dove into the swimming pool, he babbled. A dog paddled around and jumped out, crawling with leeches, clinging to my underarms and my chest. My father grabbed the cigarette out of his hired man's mouth and burned them little monsters off one by one. Youch! Robert shivered, shivered. He had once had a creek leech on his elbow and it had inspired a week of nightmares. Did you have any blood left? I was as pale as milk. Speaking of blood, that reminds me. And he launched into another tale about a hockey game where the puck had banked off the rink boards, hit a wooden post, and smacked into a politician's forehead. Robert's father laughed his guts out about that one. Still chuckling, he undid a cap on the engine and peered in. Oh, for crying out loud, he exclaimed. The tractor needs more oil. We're going to have to head to town. I was planning on going later anyway. Might as well go now. You want to go now? You want to come along? Sure, I'll tell Mom. His dad waved away the suggestion. Let's surprise her. Bring her back a licorice stick. She loves those. Within a few minutes, they were in the roadster. Robert watched out the window as the land rolled by. He had worked really hard over the past week, fetching tools, helping with the chores, and mending fences. They had spent hours repairing the grain wagon, tightening every screw and plugging every hole so the wheat wouldn't drain out. His parents had been in an extraordinarily good mood the whole time. They had kept talking about the fun they had had at the theater. Robert felt sick when he remembered his experience. He wasn't sure if he'd ever go inside that building again. When he thought about Uncle Edmund appearing in the mirror and pointing at Abraham, he got a brassy blood taste in his mouth, as though he had cut his finger and sucked on it. He looked at the horizon. It was so far away. Everything was small in the distance. Easy to lose things here, he thought. Will they ever find Matthew? Robert asked. His dad didn't answer. He just squinted down the road, grinning as if he were seeing that puck hit the politician again. Do you think they'll find Matthew? Robert persisted, struggling to make his voice louder. His father pinched his lips together as though he had tasted something sour. What? Matthew? Oh, yes, they will. I saw that sergeant in town the other day. He said they're still working on it. I told him to do the best he could. It'll be fine, Robert. Don't you worry. Just think about what's behind the candy counter in town. I'll get your mom a licorice stick, but what do you want? No, don't tell me. Surprise me. Robert wanted to ask more about Matthew, but his mouth was watering. A black jawbreaker would be good right now, or a lemony-tasting sugar candy. He shook his head. 
There was something wrong with his mind, the way he kept daydreaming, daydreaming about things he wanted, candy and firecrackers and vanilla milk whips. Every moment was filled with day, daydreams, too many of them. His dad Sherm turned sharply down Horseshoes Access Road, tires skidding. He let out a laugh. This darling sure steals, steers well. Robert was silent as they crossed the tracks. On the west side of town, he saw the school. In a few weeks, he'd be back inside that single room, writing in his scribbler or memorizing multiplication tables. School started on a Monday. He wished he could remember what day it was right now. He had looked at the Cypress Oil Company calendar that morning. It had been a day of rest, he remembered. Shouldn't we be going to church? Uh, your mom has baking to do, son, his dad said quickly. She's making apple pies. Just think of that. I can't remember the last time we had apple pie with cinnamon and a big old piece of cheddar cheese on the side. Robert pictured the apple pie steam rising from the hole in the center of the pastry, the sugary apples cooked to perfection inside. His, he wiped his mouth. He had to stop dwelling on these things. He thought about his mom. She would be at home now in the kitchen baking the pies or washing dishes and setting the plates upside down in the cupboard so they wouldn't catch the dust. Upside down dishes. The image stuck in his head. Everything was becoming upside down. His parents should be sad now and wishing for Matthew to come home. Instead, they talked only nonsense and laughed too loudly. There were several cars and trucks on Main Street and a few wagons. People streamed in and out of the hotel, the pool parlor, and the grocery store. Robert wondered if it hadn't been a field day or a parade day and they had missed it. His dad steered around three men jabbering away in the middle of the road and parked in front of the bank. A line of people stood there waiting in front of a table on the boardwalk. Robert's dad snapped his fingers. Oh, yes, that's what I wanted to come to town today. I need to sign up for that deal. Come on, son. He jumped out of the roadster. Robert followed him, and they joined a row of about 15 men. There were unshaven cowboys from the Spears Ranch in the Cypress Hills, hired hands from the big farm, sandhill sheep herders, even some hobos with blanket rolls slung over their shoulders. The lineup ended at a table where the war widows were handing out lemonade and cookies. Standing beside them, shaking each person's hand, was Mr. Samuelson. The closer Robert got to the front of the line, the more uneasy he became. He didn't like the raunchous, tumbling laughter that rolled out of Samuelson every time he shook a hand. There was no sign of Abraham. When they reached the very front, Robert knew what was worrying him the most. He wanted to grab his father's arm and pull him away because signing your name was like putting a piece of yourself down on paper. It was a promise for all eternity. His father, grinning, reached for the pen and dipped it in ink. Don't, Dad, Robert thought. He even lifted his arm to stop him, but it was too late. His father had scratched out his signature and immediately shook Samuelson's hand as though they had been buddies all their lives. You're a good man, Steelgate, Samuelson said. Great to have you aboard. Robert had heard his father curse Samuelson a thousand times. Now they were shaking hands. Samuelson muttered a joke so Robert couldn't hear it. Robert's dad burst into laughter, and then he steered Robert over to the lemonade and cookies. Hi, Robbie, Mrs. Jeskin said. Looking forward to having you back in class. You're a good student. Robert silently clutched the cookie in his right hand and nodded to her, because it was better not to say anything. His father had already finished his lemonade co and cookie and was wiping his mouth. He led Robert back to the roadster, saying, Let's go get that candy. I don't want any. Robert couldn't believe what he had just heard himself say, and his father laughed. All the more for me and Mom, he said, starting jauntily to the pool parlor. Robert poured the lemonade onto the dusty road and dropped the cookie behind one of the roadster's back wheels. He watched as the line in front of the bank grew even longer. All right, so that is chapters 10 and 11. Um, tell me what you think about how they didn't go to church and they're not.